think we can agree that there are a lot of useless kitchen tools out there, like this handleless rubber spatula. Today I'll be introducing some of my favorite kitchen utensils and talk about why I don't like some of these other kitchen utensils and why I prefer to use something else like this here. Now let's talk a little bit about the two knives here. I got a stainless steel and a carbon steel chef's knife. Now if you're not professionally cooking, I would recommend getting a stainless steel over the carbon steel because if you take a look up close, it's a little hard to see but it starts to build some rust and it does require a lot of maintenance. I think a lot of people say, oh, when you first pick up your knife, you should be able to be comfortable with it the moment you pick it up. I personally don't know. I didn't really get used to this bigger 10 inch knife because I used this 8 inch knife my whole entire life. But then when I switched over and I got used to it, man that must have been the best decision I have ever made because I can never go back now. And when you do start cooking, how are you supposed to be comfortable with a knife that you've never used before? I think it's just something that grows over time. You know, I kind of buy knives for the practicality of it, but let's say for example this 8 inch knife right here. This is a Damascus means it's got this really cool design on it, but it really has no practical use. And you know what? It's stainless steel. It takes longer to sharpen, and even though people say its edge holds for a longer period of time, I would personally go with this carbon steel where I can keep it sharp by sharpening it with less time, which ultimately means that it feels super satisfying when you cut into food. Hence why I prefer to use a carbon steel chef's knife. This is a carbon steel paring knife you see in my videos sometimes. This guy comes in super handy when I'm working with smaller ingredients or when I'm doing detailing jobs. It makes cutting food a lot easier than using a huge knife when it's called for. As for the Japanese knives here, they're Japanese because the blade is shaped in a certain form for different jobs. They usually have a beautiful classic wooden handle to them and they come in different handle shapes. There are circular ones, but my personal favorite handle type is in the octagon shape which gives me a very sturdy grip when I'm holding the knife. Now I prefer wet zones here because when I sharpen my knife, I can actually control how sharp I want my knife to be. I have three wet stones here. This one is a wet stone flattener, a 1000 grit wet stone, and a 6000 grit wet stone finisher. Usually I only use these two whetstones to sharpen my knife, but I also do have like a 400 grit and an 800 grit whetstone just in case I have to sharpen a really beaten up knife like this one over here. I also have this little tiny whetstone here and it's used to remove rust, most commonly from a carbon steel knife and this thing here basically acts as an eraser. Now something super simple that I love is this knife sharpener. You just put your knife through a couple of times and honestly it is a lot better than nothing. It's such a quality of life product because learning how to sharpen with a whetstone is not easy. So for those of you out there with a dull knife, get one of these. Now I think this one is a given, but measuring tools are an absolute essential. Most of the time when you're cooking for yourself, you don't really need to measure, but when you're making food from a recipe, measuring is vital. And it is especially important when it comes to baking. I'd like to give a special shout out to this old school cuisine art skill because I used to be just like many other people out there, a user of an electronic skill. You can see that this one has collected dust over time because I simply don't use this anymore. I use this to measure all my recipes and it's a lot more accurate than what digital numbers give. And it actually uses the gravity around us to give up a precise measurement. Now I'm not saying electronic skills are bad or anything, they're aesthetically pleasing to look at and they take up less space, but for accurate measurements, this guy gives the best results. I think I can say with confidence that I will never go back to using one of these plastic bowls ever again because these guys serve almost little to no purpose other than the fact that they're cheap. I'd much rather have one of these stainless steel bowls because they are durable and it can withstand both hot and cold temperatures. Then when you do find yourself buying a strainer, you'll magically notice that they always seem to fit inside one of these magically universal size bowls perfectly. Now out of all the tongs here, I have one that I absolutely do not like and it's this kind over here. It's one with the silicone ends. Can you imagine trying to grab something in a pan with some oiled up food and it's just slipping out of your tongs? Like why can't I grab it? 
Maybe it's just my unskilled hands of being able to grab things with silicone. Now the only reason I can see someone using this is with a Teflon pan. So it doesn't scratch the surface if you're a wonderful pan. But let's be honest here, you mostly need tongs for grabbing things like meat and fish. But it's not a very wise idea to use a Teflon pan for things that involve very high heat. Alright, let's talk about the tong that I actually do like, and it's this one over here, and it's kind of a must that there is a lock right here, so I can unleash the tong, because when I put this in my bag or my kitchen drawers, I don't want it to take up all the space that I only have a little of, which is occupied by my other tools. This tong has a very nice spring, and it is very easy on the hands as it should be, because tongs are like an extra hand that you can touch hot things with that you wouldn't normally want to with your beautiful, tender hands. And if you are one of those people looking to buy tongs, do me a favor and don't get the cheap tongs. Look at this, they don't even close properly. When I first started cooking, I started using this round wooden spoon here and that was the biggest mistake of my life. Now I am a firm believer of this flat-ended wooden spoon. And for those of you who have made classic mother sauces before, I think you all understand why a flat-ended wooden spoon is so important. Now what happens is that when you are stirring something that has a low smoking point like flour, it tends to stick to the bottom of the pan. So as you are mixing, you are actually reaching the bottom of the pan to make sure nothing is sticking. A whisk is mainly used for baking as such when you're making breads and desserts. Here's my problem. Like with the tongs, I don't ever see a reason why you would need it to be made of silicone. When you're working with heavier batters, these guys don't mix well and it's much better to have one made of steel and have a rubber spatula on the side. The end result, you're probably saving more time by using two separate tools, but if all your frying pans are nonstick, this is probably what you're looking for. I personally like these whisks made of steel because they are so much more durable and can actually do the job they were made to do. Now I have this tiny one because I use it for making small portions, but it's nice to have a big whisk if you are a serious baker. But for the average person out there, I would highly recommend a medium sized whisk. Maybe something in between these two. A kitchen scissor is one of those things you never knew you wanted until you got it. These are kind of a niche product because you can do a lot of what a scissor can do with other kitchen tools. That is until you start dealing with the decapita order of the crustacean family, which are lobsters, shrimps, prawns, and crabs. The scissors can easily cut open the shell from the stomach side with ease. It makes my life a whole lot easier, and if you are serious about cooking, I would highly recommend this. As you may have noticed now, there are a lot of products I avoid. In the world of peelers, I avoid one type of peeler, and it's this expensive one here. At first glance, most people would think, it's a very nice peeler. Indeed, it is a very nice peeler but I much prefer this one over here. The thing with this one is that it's cheap. Over time, the blade from peelers tend to get dull and they no longer can function as well as it used to. Of course, at this point, you can go and buy some replacement blades, but wait, I don't think I've ever seen any company that sells replacement blades for their own peeler. Get a cheap one. This kind of rolling pin is pretty much the definition of rolling pins. They feel good when you roll out your cookies, but I've abandoned the idea of a rolling pin and downgraded myself to just a long wooden stick. Sometimes when I'm making dough that call for a very hard dough like ramen and udon, the rolling pins no longer do the job and I feel that the metal rod in the pin just starts to bend and it's about to break. But with this wooden stick, I no longer have any worries in the world. But unless you want to make ramen and udon, the rolling pin is an ultimate quality of life product. With the rising popularity of every YouTube chef out there saying that you need to get one of these damn things, I'd like to add in, yeah, you probably should. These classic ones I have here are classic for a reason, and they do the job that they are assigned to do. But I also have this combination timer thermometer from IKEA, and this thing works wonders. This thing has a heat resistant cord that resists up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. I can set the temperature and it gives this beeping sound so when you are waiting for something while you're in another room, you know it's time to come back. So I have a lot of pots and pans here, so I'll put the others away first. Let's first talk about the nonstick. 
The pan is an essential in every household. These guys are great for low to medium temperature cooking. You don't need much oil to use one of these guys and they are great for cooking things like eggs and foods that you don't want sticking. However, these fry pans do lose their non-stick coating over time and will have to be replaced once it is worn out. But it is still worth your run for the money because these guys are so easy to cook with. However, if you do need very high temperatures and need things to stick to the frying pan, the stainless steel frying pan is indispensable. This guy can stand very high temperatures which is required when you are cooking things like fishes and meat. Of course you can do the same as well for non-stick. But to be able to keep your entire fry pan under its small temperature limit is something I'm not so sure about. Finally, I have here a cast iron frying pan. The cast iron takes a while to heat up. It is commonly known for holding hot temperatures for a very long time. And it is difficult for it to lose temperature, making it perfect for cooking things like beef, chicken, and scallops. I know they're not cheap, but if you have the luxury to do so, get one of these. Otherwise, I would just stick with the non-stick and stainless steel frying pans. Let's move on to the pots and pans. Now, I always have a small medium-sized pot so I can work in smaller batches for soups and sauces. But when I need to make things in big batches like for ramen, stock, and boiling pasta, this guy always comes in handy. So I always have one large pot and one small to medium-sized pot handy. Now, I would always recommend getting a pot made of anything aside from non-stick because that day you think you will need it will probably never come. So it's always best to have it in its stainless steel form. Now if any of you are familiar with bakeries, cafes, and restaurants, you know that these guys are almost identical to the industry standard. Although this is a luxury, working using the KitchenAid stand mixer has honestly never been any easier. You can do so many things with the attachment parts, which includes a meat grinder, pasta roller, and even an ice cream maker. This is so close to what professionals use, but this is only a quality of life product, and you can still do fine making doughs and batters without it. Now these are some of the essentials that I believe are needed in every kitchen. And if you have any kitchen essentials that you prefer, let me know down in the comments section below. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. See ya.